All right. Um, well, welcome, everyone. We are really thrilled to have uh, you here with us today. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I am a professor at Rutgers University. I also serve as the executive director of both the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice and the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And we are the proud sponsor of today's event. Uh, we are really, really thrilled to have Walter Kimbrough with us, who is our president in residence this year. And he's just been doing amazing things with us. And we have a lot more planned for the rest of the year. Um, as you may know, uh, I'm very excited uh, to have um, Walter here. He's been a friend for years and years and years. Uh, some of you may know him as the past president of Philander Smith College or Dillard College. He's got amazing expertise in uh, higher education, but he also has expertise in hazing in terms of uh, being able to really help us to understand hazing and uh, trends in hazing. And so today's uh, webinar is called Current Trends in Hazing, and using his experience as an expert witness in hazing cases, he is going to cover recent trends, including the differences between culturally based groups, and um, will also provide a, a history of hazing at higher education institutions. He's going to discuss how hazing manifests today, and he's also going to discuss the legal challenges facing individuals and organizations due to hazing. And and he's going to give us a presentation and then he's going to take questions. So as we're going along, please put your questions in the Q&A and we will be answering those at the end of this session. Uh, Walter, I just want to say thank you again for being our president in residence. I cannot imagine a better person to be president in residence with us. And thank you for doing this session today on hazing. I, you know, of course, have read your book related to the topic and know that this is a topic that you care immensely about. We're thrilled to have you here with us today and take it away. All right, so good afternoon to everyone. I am coming to you live from Rutgers here in New Jersey. So I'm glad to be here and sharing with the, the team. And so I wanna jump right in and, and go through a number of things so that you can get an idea of what's going on with this issue of hazing. Uh, and so let me, give you the context first of all. Um, Tom Nichols wrote a book. He started off with this article that you see that was in the Federalist, but wrote a book about this idea of expertise. Um, and one of the things he says is that, you know, for certain things and his expertise is around, you know, war, military, those kind of geopolitical issues. Uh, he says in this article, you know, he's an expert, not on everything, but a particular area. So when he says something, he expects that that opinion would hold more weight than that of most other people. And the court sometimes come up with something that they call an expert witness. And so they define it a little bit differently. It is someone with a special knowledge or skill or experience that goes beyond the ordinary experience uh, of members of the general public. So I'm presenting this today, not as someone who's been a president or worked in student affairs. My first job was in Greek life at Emory University, but as an expert witness, okay? So I was first asked to be an expert witness in 1998. Uh, and as you can see, since that time, uh, I've been asked 34 times. And you can see a range of different types of organizations, both NIC, MPHC, and band organizations, um, and then some university-related cases as well. So lots of experience, um, reading lots of depositions, seeing a lot of crazy things. But it really gives you an insight is what I hope to do today in terms of what's really going on. So when we talk about this idea of hazing, what, what are we talking about? And this comes from stophazing.org. And that, I like this. This is a very basic definition that's very plain. And I always encourage people, take definitions like this, but look at your state definitions as well, because sometimes there are some nuanced differences between what the state says and some of these definitions, even for your campus. But this definition, I think, is really good, you know, in terms of humiliating, degrading, abusing, and danger. And I think the key phrase here is regardless of a person's willingness to participate, because there have been cases in the past where an organization or a group was charged with hazing, and they will say, well, they, they volunteered to do it. And it's really sort of hard to say someone has volunteered to do something that the other members don't have to do as well. So that's an important part of it. This is where we're, what we're dealing with, though. About half of all college students experience hazing, okay? It's a large number. So a lot of times we 
focus heavily on fraternities and sororities, but we're talking about half of students. Uh, and this is the part I think that we're missing that I think we've got to do more work and outreach to middle and high school students about their experiences with hazing. About half of students come to college having experienced at least some level of hazing. And it could be very benign. My son is in the ninth grade. He plays junior varsity basketball. They practice with the varsity. And one day the varsity people took the practice uniforms and hit them. Okay. Very benign, but technically that's hazing. So he would have had an experience with that as well. And so those are the kind of issues that we we see. So I'm seeing it in my own household in terms of where those beginnings ha happen. And as you can see, it happens over a wide range, but the top two are athletics and Greek life. And of course, Greek life is the one that gets most of the attention nationally that's driven a lot of change that we see because normally with those cases, you see death. OK, but you can see you can have a range of, of hazing. And I want to talk about some of that today um, before we go. This is our challenge, though, as uh, folks who work on campuses. Students don't want to report it because it is it, counterintuitive. Why would you report a group that's hazing and you're really trying to join the group? That defeats the purpose, because if you report it, if the group gets shut down, then you don't become a member. If you become a member, but the people that you were trying to be a member with all get suspended, you don't have a relationship with them. So it's hard for someone to say, report you're being hazed when you're really trying to be a part of that group. And you think about the organization more locally than you know nationally as you would for a fraternity and sorority. So they understand a national entity exists, but it's sort of nebulous. They don't really understand what that means. They know what that local chapter looks like, and that is their experience with that organization. So those are the kinds of things that um, we see that people just don't report. And that becomes our challenge and it continues to be our challenge, okay? So let's talk about who's hazing. Well, the, the first hazers, and this is the history, and I think this makes it a challenge for us because hazing is something we can trace back to the 1400s in German universities. The freshmen had to carry around pen cases, they called them penals, um, and they performed a, lot of, performed a lot of menial personal servitude. Um, in Great Britain in the 1700s, they had a different kind of process that was a little bit more physical and violent. And so in the mid-1800s in the United States, we called it hazing. And it was for freshmen. And just like in Great Britain and in Germany, the new students weren't viewed as being good enough to be there. So they had to sort of earn their way or prove themselves. And so pictures from a yearbook might show scenes like this, you know, the, the historical beanie that uh, the young man is wearing is a part of it. But if you look at some of the smaller pictures, um, you know, behind him, it looks like that the, the freshman is being kicked in the behind or the top left, you know, thrown over an open flame. Those are the kinds of issues. This was at uh, Stanford, and this was about 100 years ago, and it, they called it a freshman death notice. So the sophomores put this up, and there's you see the mighty sophomores, and it basically says, you guys aren't good enough. Your day is coming. Um, each paragraph, the first letter of that paragraph is highlighted. And if you read that, it says, wash thy sin away. So that was the kind of message that was giving the freshmen that you're not good enough to be here and we're going to do something to you. So we had these kind of activities at Indiana University they called it freshman and sophomore class rushes. And this is what rush looked like. And basically during rush, the sophomores chased the freshmen and beat them down. That's, that's all it was. And you can see the persons with hats on. I think it looks like there are some administrative type folks that are there. So this was university sanctioned activity. Um, at Indiana, they even had it where sophomores would literally scalp freshmen, take a knife and literally cut the hair off the top of their heads. So if you were a freshman and we're talking about men in higher education, after rush, you would look like this, okay? I mean, it was it was a beatdown. It was very violent. This was a part of hazing uh, in early American higher education. OK, it's ironic, too, because, you know, particularly in the 70s and 80s, when people were joining fraternities and sororities, we called it rush. Well, this is the original rush. So you want to that's the history of the word where it comes from. So then next, when we start thinking about hazing and even today, we think about our IFC fraternities, the predominantly white fraternities and Really, it takes on a different meaning with the release of the 1977 film Animal House. And that really was popular culture trying to tell us this is what fraternity life is like. And it was the partying, the drinking, and the hazing, and those kinds of things. But unfortunately, over the years, we've seen more and more hazing cases. I always tell people when I was a director of student activities at 
at uh, Old Dominion that fall was always scary for me because you knew something could just happen. And I remember one fall when I was at Old Dominion, it must have been about 1997, there were several high profile cases, a hazing death at MIT, hazing death at LSU. Uh, it was just a horrible fall to, to, to be in that field. Well, we saw that 20 years later in 2017, where we had four high profile deaths, most notably at Penn State um, with Tim Piazza, but you also had it at Florida State, at Texas State, and at LSU again, okay? Um, and so you can just see these are the kinds of headlines. These are big national stories. But there have been a range of these stories over years. And here's just a sample of some of the things that people are seeing about fraternity hazing and the range of things that we've seen. So pledges swimming and vomit, um, racism involved in making pledges act like they're slaves as a part of it. Um, where I went to grad school at Miami University, uh, 2016, they had 21 different complaints. So just all kinds of things that are happening at Ivy League institutions, uh, pledge initiations, they're chanting, they're talking about being necrophiliacs, uh, having sex with dead women. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're dealing with. Hot sauce and eyes, body slams, underage drinking, uh, force feeding a dog beer, all of it, I mean, you can see. So you're now having this kind of um, image reinforced that Animal House brought to the public light. It, it, it constantly be, is reinforced. Uh, 2018, I found out about this photo uh, uh, essay, if you will, or picture book that really looked at uh, fraternities in a different kind of way. And these are some of the pictures that they were able to use in the book in terms of what was happening with pledging and hazing and people, you know, halfway past style, those kinds of, of issues. So with all the, the backlash, particularly in the fall of 2017, the CEO of the North American Interfraternity Conference is being grilled on CBS this morning. He also did an interview with Anderson Cooper on CNN. And it's just hard to, you know, defend the indefensible, which is what he was really trying to do. So those groups really get a lot of attention. When people think about hazing, they mostly think of predominantly white fraternities. We don't think about Panhellenic organizations, the predominantly white sororities as much, uh, because there hasn't, it's not the same kind of hazing, and it's been sort of undercover. There was a book written by Esther Wright called Torn Togas, and she, from her experience in Southern California, talked about hazing that sort of gave people an impression that no, there are some hazing that's going on. It might look differently, but some of it could be just as bad in different ways. So date rape drugs, date rape happening as a part of sorority initiations, um, some that becomes, you know, a little bit more physical, um, eating mud, those kind and, and trash as a part of um, hazing ritual. Alcohol can be a part of it as well. Um, hazing a male student, so some some cross work with organizations in terms of the kinds of things that they're doing. Um, so you don't see these as often. They're they're rare. Maybe once a year, twice a year. This, once again, at LSU um, in the state of Louisiana, we've had a number of hazing issues. Um, so you can see those kinds of cases as well. Um, and even in terms of bigger picture, when people look at hazing and then how organizations decide who becomes in based on their physical appearance, that has also been a part of the hazing that people brought to bear as well, okay? So not as much. We haven't had any major lawsuits with those groups um, as of yet, but uh, it just sort of teeters on the brink of that. We also then talk about historically Black fraternities and sororities, Okay. Um, and really the idea of hazing was something that really wasn't always um, uh, sort of hidden. This is a picture from a 1940 yearbook at Clark Atlanta or Clark College back then. Um, and this is one of the yearbook dividers. And I always tell students, you see this picture. And then after this, you see all the fraternity men and their tucks is smiling. And so it's like this dichotomy to say, wait a minute, the section header shows someone with the being paddled. OK, and then everybody's dressed up uh, looking like angels. Those are the kinds of things. But a decade after Animal House, uh, Spike Lee had school days, 1988. I was a uh, junior at the University of Georgia. I remember going to the theater to watch the movie because we heard the alphas from Morehouse were in the movie Stepping. Uh, and it showed a lot of things. And it was really interesting because at that time, a lot of members were saying, oh, Spike Lee was just mad because he couldn't make it. He didn't join. That stuff doesn't really happen. Um, but people missed some, some key facts about that movie. The young man in the middle wearing the Omega Sci-Fi jacket um, 
was a part of a line at Morehouse College. I think there were 22 of them that started pledging, and he was the only one that was initiated. So back in the language of the 1980s, 21 people dropped line. That means they quit. He was the only one that made it. And he was uh, Spike Lee's um, expert to, to talk about, you know, uh, Greek life and pledging and those kinds of things. So he had a member of a fraternity who was sort of his expert about what Greek life was like. The person to his left, if you're looking at the screen on your right, um, uh, play Ron in a different world, okay? He is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Players at Syracuse. So now you have two people with fraternity experiences that are part of this group. And then finally, there was a relative of one of the guys who was playing one of the pledges, the Gamites in the movie, was actually pledging a fraternity in Atlanta University Center when they were making the movie. And he would hide out in their hotel room. So now they have a, a living example of what pledging looks like. And that sort of entered into the movie as well. So you've got your expert, you've got someone else who has a fraternity experience, and then you're watching somebody pledge as you make this movie, okay? The real crazy thing about that is that the very next year at Morehouse College, Joel Harris died pledging my fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha. I was leaving our national board as the, the college brother uh, that represented the Southeastern region. And at our convention that summer, the national president, the general counsel said, we have no uh, hazing cases. Everybody's excited. Fall of uh, 1989, the, the quarter that I graduated, Joel Harris died at Morehouse. He had a pre-existing heart condition. The members knew that. So when they were off campus hazing, no one touched Joel. He's at one side of the apartment. The other side of the apartment, they're just beating the hell out of the pledges. He passed out and died. He was not touched. The coroner said no bruises, nothing on him, but he still died as a part of that. And that really became something because that immediately, several months later, the National Panhellenic Council, the, the umbrella body for the Black Greek Little Organizations, presidents got together and they're like, that's it. I tell people it's almost like the alphas are killing people and they're supposed to be the smart ones, okay? So we saw this move then to go from pledging to membership intake. And it was going to be a, a hard cultural change to say, we're going to just stop pledging and people are just going to come in. And that didn't work. And we saw evidence of that within just a couple of years. This case at Southeast Missouri, this is four years later. Um, this young man, the coroner said it looked like his body had been in a rapid deceleration car accident. He had a torn liver, lung, kidney, spleen, brain, and his heart was bleeding. Um, Deborah Roberts did a 20-minute segment um, for um, ABC, and she interviewed some of the men who were arrested as a part of that. Um, it was gave people a lot of insight into what was happening um, that night, that February in 1994. And so we've continued to see more people be arrested. This case at Southern Methodist University, um, the fraternity had been suspended. They had just come back on campus. They went to a mandatory anti-hazing program. That night, they went out and hazed, okay? Uh, you start to see then people sharing their stories more openly. This young man who went to Emory, it was a year after he had been hazed. He sent out a letter with pictures of everything that happened to him. So this is 2004. And so these are the kinds of pictures that he sent out to the press, uh, to experts. Uh, his mom called me looking for a lawyer. And I don't know how she found me because I wasn't working at Emory at the time when all of this happened, Okay. Um, this was a case, once again, people don't understand what can happen to a person based on their biology. This young man has the sickle cell disease trait. I also have the trait, which if you can have maximum exertion or overexertion, sometimes your blood cells can sickle, making it difficult for you to breathe. And so they're out, Prairie View is north of Houston, is really sort of in the middle of nowhere. They're out, you know, running, he passes out and dies. Uh, this is a big case because they were going to sue $400 million. Uh, this, this is 2011, you see a case, they're beating with canes or shooting down um, with BB guns as a part of this, okay? Uh, I shared this, I met with students at, at Rutgers and shared this even on this campus. Uh, this is almost 15 years ago, 14 years ago, sorority hazing case. And once again, with sororities, you don't see as much. We did have a high profile death though uh, in California where they were creating uh, an opportunity for people to sort of cross the sands. If you've worked with Black fraternities and sororities before, you've heard that terminology when people are about to be initiated. But West Coast people went out to the ocean and went out to the, the beach to sort of cross the sands. Uh, but they were out there and got caught up in a riptide. And these two young ladies died. One was a mother, one was married. Uh, and it, it garnered a lot of national attention. Dr. Field did a segment, those kinds of things. So there's a range of ways where people are 
feeling the impacts. This was a case, I was an expert witness on this case. They were about to be initiated, sleep deprivation, um, going to get their hair done, driver fell asleep at the wheel and two young ladies died as a part of that. So we're still seeing these kinds of cases, things that are happening. Um, this is just a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine uh, told me about it, that they were basically saying the women in the chapter were beating um, the other, the, the pledges like they were men. I mean, using fists, it was very violent, forcing them to go you know, get alcohol and marijuana, those kinds of things were happening as well. So we, we continue to see lots of these kinds of cases as well, and even more with sororities recently, okay? There's been a lot of growth of the Latino fraternal organizations. They're older than most people think. Um, Phi Alpha was founded in 1931. There were actually secret Latino societies, even in states like Louisiana in the late 1800s. But the Latino fraternal movement really starts then in the 1930s, and you see um, some other growth in the 60s and 70s, particularly here in New Jersey. King College uh, is a, a foundational place in 1975 for Lambda Theta Alpha and Lambda Theta Phi. Um, so you start to see this development. Then by the 1980s, you have, uh, back then it was Black Issues in Higher Education, now known as Diverse. People are really starting to wake up say we have Latino fraternities and sororities, um, particularly in the 80s and 90s, fraternities and sororities said no more pledging where people would walk in line on campus and dress alike. In the early 90s, Latino groups were doing that openly on campuses, and it created some challenges. So if you had um, a group um, like this one, you know, at Cornell University in the 90s, people would see those kinds of things. Same kind of thing here. Um, this was normal. You don't see that as much now, but this was a part of the challenges that we would have seen with the Latino fraternal organizations. So still some of that, not as much, which has been really good that we haven't answered with the Latino fraternal organizations, okay? But we still seen some of that. The, the really interesting one for me that I think requires more um, research and conversation are the Asian interest organizations. Now, this is the thing that always blows people's minds because Asian fraternal organizations have been around in the United States as early as 1916. This is Rosa at Cornell University. By 1920, they even had a house on campus, okay? So people don't really even know a lot about these groups. Um, and so you had that growth. You had some groups in the 20s and 30s, then more really in the, in the uh, 60s, and then even more in the 80s and 90s and even today, okay? But the challenge with them is that they have been branded, this article from the Daily Beast in 2009 called them the new animal houses because Based on the number of groups and the size, you have a disproportionate number of severe hazing cases and even hazing deaths associated with the Asian interest fraternal organizations. Um, it, it's just been, it's a disproportionate impact. And those are the kinds of conversations that we need to have to figure out what is going on with these groups. This is one of the groups, 2015, 37 members were arrested, five facing murder charges. And you can sort of see them, I mean, you know, shackled, those kinds of things that are happening with these groups that people don't know a lot about. I mean, this is a more recent one for Michigan State University. Um, there's an article from New York Times Magazine that really starts to ask questions like, what is going on with these groups? It was from several years ago that people are trying to figure out what's happening with the Asian interest organizations. So if you have those groups on your campus, it's something to really pay attention to because it's sort of flown underneath the radar. But I have a lot of concerns about what's really going on, but there really isn't any good research. So it might be a good research topic for some. Okay, so like I said, most people think about hazing, we think about fraternities and sororities, but it's much more than that. Um, band hazing, particularly um, HBCU bands, there is a really strong culture. You have band fraternities and sororities, which do the same kinds of things as the MPHC groups. And it's really interesting because you'll have people who are, well, pledge the MPHC group, then pledge the band fraternity as well. So there is a lot of co-mingling of ideas and how fraternalism is expressed. Um, but it's not just people who are pledging those band-related organizations, which do have some hazing cases. You have people who are pledging sections in band. So you might pledge the drum section or the clarinet section. 
those are the kinds of things that were happening. That was happening. Um, young man, I was an expert for Southern University when this happened. Um, young man ended up in a hospital based on some of the things. But this was the the big story because the average person didn't really understand there was such a thing as ban hazing, not for real, until the FAMU death happened. And this was huge. As you see, this is George Stephanopoulos on ABC News. So, you know, it's really this is mainstream media spending a lot of time covering this case. Uh, and they were just sharing that, you know, this is a case where they had this process that uh, to get respect, the, the young man who died was already a drum major, which is interesting, non-traditional student, 25 years old. But the drum section really didn't respect him. And so he had to do this thing called crossing bus C. And this is during their Thanksgiving football game against Bethune-Cookman, where you sort of run the gauntlet on the bus after hours. They're on the bus. And they're beating him and kicking and hitting him with drumsticks and all those kinds of things. Um, and so the autopsy, the coroner basically says the muscle damage that he had from that process is, is, is comparable to what people would see in car accidents or prolonged seizures or child abuse and torture. Those are the kinds of things. So actually, it was 26 when he died. Those are the kinds of things that the damage that we're still seeing cases after that uh, at Bowie State. And then we started to see other cases as well. So even places like University of California, Berkeley uh, had an issue. I mean, Cal Davis had a, a situation with their student run marching band. OK, so when I started thinking about it and working different cases and I, I actually worked the, the FAMU case, which is interesting because I had to go to Florida A&M and interview people affiliated with the band and people in the judicial office to get an idea of what was happening with that case, which was really interesting. Um, when you start doing enough of these cases, you start to see different things. And so I coined this term a number of years ago that I call extended adolescence, okay? And these are people that for campuses, you have to think about, and we don't think about this, we think about hazing, but here are some people that you need to look out for. In general, they're about 24 to 30 years old. Uh, they aren't really active. If they're like an MPAC organization, they aren't inter active in the graduate chapter or anything like that. You see them on campus. Some of you might not even know they aren't students anymore, okay? They're, I always tell people they're on campus. When I worked on a campus, they were on campus more than I was. Um, those are some of the challenges. But these are the folks who are really behind a lot of the things that are happening because they have this notion that you should follow what we're telling you to do. They, they own the level of respect that's greater than the national organization that the people on campus. Um, I, like, as I said, I spoke to undergraduates of the multicultural groups at here at Rutgers on Monday night. And when I talked about this, you can see people nodding their heads and smile. And I was like, oh, y'all know who I'm talking about. They were like, yeah. I mean, in that, if you haven't paid attention, you should pay attention to those folks that are hanging out. Here's a prime example and how they can be costly, okay? This is a case in South Carolina, Francis Marion University, hazing that was happening off campus, members of the fraternity. Uh, it was at this man's house, okay? He's a high school science teacher, 34 years old, extended adolescent, even a little bit older than what I would say, okay? But these are the people that are aiding, abetting, and actually committing some of the hazing crimes. And you can see that in a lot. I've looked at cases where no one is an active student that they've arrested and they're 27, 28, 29, 30 years old. So that's a group that you've got to pay attention to. If you see those folks just hanging out, I, I would really keep an eye on them because that can become a problem. And then we have what I'm calling sort of the gateway drug of hazing. Because I showed you early on, student, half of students are coming understanding hazing. So for all of us in higher ed, we've got to start doing more with high school, high school athletic associations, middle schools, because they're predisposed to understanding what hazing looks like before they get to us. So we're already behind the eight ball trying to do remedial work because they're experiencing hazing. The hazing is overwhelmingly... Um, with, you know, young men in high schools, even though, and I haven't found a video, I don't, if you're old enough, you might remember on Oprah, she did um, an episode about some girls being hazed outside of Chicago, and they had the video, and it was very violent and brutal, so we don't really see a lot of that. Normally, we see it in high school with boys and athletic teams, okay, and as this says, a lot of the incidents involving sodomy, which is, you know, one of the things that you know, what's going on with young men, those kinds of things, okay? 
Um, but here you go. Sodomize with a cue. This is 2016, okay? With a pool cue, all right? Um, here you go. Doing sit-ups in the buttocks, canceling football season. Uh, another one, this is 2022, hot sauce, butt cheeks. You, you can have a death that happens, okay? Um, still rare, but I'm I'm seeing more and more high school hazing cases. And I think because people are more aware of hazing, parents are reporting it and young people are reporting it as well. Uh, and so in the end, really, you name it, it's, it's some of everybody's hazing. I mean, you, you talk about it with Marines, you talk about it with a dance team. I've seen dance teams, I've seen cheerleader hazing. Uh, this is a healthcare sorority that's hazing. So anytime there can be a group, you can... And there is you have to join that group. There is a potential for hazing. It's something that we have to start thinking about. So giving you this background, then, what are some of the trends that I've noticed? I want to give three, um, and then we'll be able to get into um, some questions that you have. And I hope you will we'll share some questions. Um, the courts are playing an increasingly um, active role. Um, I, you know, I don't advertise and tell people I do expert hazing work, but at least two to three times a year, there's a, a lawyer that reaches out to say, hey, I'm working on the case. I just finished the case. Uh, several months ago. And so I'm usually working on at least one case a year. Um, that's that's how much people want to, to, to address these, these issues. Um, let, let me give you this example, because I think this shows you how laws have, have changed and how it impacts young people. Um, and this is one of the best examples I can think about, okay? So in the state of Florida, they passed the Chad Meredith Act um, this is about 2004, 2005. There was a student at the University of Miami who was pledging an IFC fraternity. He was drunk. He drowned in the lake. You weren't supposed to swim in this lake anyway because it had alligators and crocodiles in it. So he's swimming in this lake with the, these animals in it. But he drowns, and he passed this really hard hazing uh, law. A couple of years later, members of Cap Alpha Psi of Florida and m Hey, is a young man. This young man's father is a member of the fraternity. Uh, and so he had been beaten very badly. Uh, he drives from Tallahassee to Decatur, Georgia, where he's from. He lost a lot of blood. I mean, it was just bad. So they get arrested now under this Chad Meredith Act. Uh, and the difference, as I try to tell students, is that this was the first time we were able to really get a peek inside of a courtroom when a case was happening. So they had the photographer in there and they were giving the updates as a part of their news stories of the coverage. So you got to see the five members of the fraternity who were arrested and charged with hazing. This is the young man who was hazed. Um, that's the, uh, the cane that he was beaten with. He shows, you know, they're asking what weapon was used. That's his girlfriend and her hands are the pictures because they took pictures of his injuries as most people who are hazed do these days. Um, that's his line brother. And they're saying, well, when you were beaten with the cane or paddle, what did you do? So that was the position that he had to get into. So if you were a member of a black fraternity and sorority, particularly in the seventies and eighties, people would say, you know, everything should be done discreetly. And I tell people now, everything that people do has an opportunity to be shown in public. This is an open court and it's placed online because there's a photographer and they're taking pictures to say, this is what it looked like. That's the position. Okay. That's the doctor. He said that the size of the wound was about that size for that young man. Okay. So after they deliberate, two of the five were arrested for hazing. The young man in the middle, who was the SGA president and the chapter president. Um, and when he was arrested, they actually came and took him out of class. So he was arrested publicly in front of his peers. They pulled him out of class to arrest him. So now he's been convicted of hazing, this new law to go to jail. So they take them into custody immediately in that courtroom. You can see the young man, he's kissing his girlfriend who's pregnant at the time, okay? So they come back for sentencing. You got a lot of people coming back to support, give their statements. These are good students, they're leaders. That's the, the girlfriend, she's pregnant. She's like, we're about to have this baby. He can't be in jail. The judge, you know, he he talks, he gives his statement to the judge. She says, I'm not trying to hear it. Y'all both get two years. The, the sentence was anywhere from, I think, two to five years. She gave them both two years. So then they end up in the Florida Department of Corrections in the system. Okay. So you went to the website. You can pull the information out there publicly available. Okay. 
So these are the kinds of things that are happening. So that set a new standard for people. And we saw the same kinds of things happen then. Once again, in the state of Florida, same, you know, Chad Meredith Act, they are, you know, arresting band members after the young man died. They have them testify. But this was different because they had several of them who flipped and became witnesses. And so they told everything. They started arresting people. People found it, found guilty. One person got a year. The one that they thought was the ring leader got 77 months in jail. Uh, and then another got a couple of years. So this is the aftermath. This, Like I said, the FAMU case was big. Robert Champion, who was a drum major, died. Uh, six and a half years, a seven, seven, 77 month sentence. That young man tried to appeal to get out earlier. They, and that was a couple of years ago. They were just like, no, you're serving the whole time. Uh, one served four, one served one. Uh, three with 10 years supervised probation, and then nine cut plea deals. And I keep trying to tell students, somebody is going to tell because their mom is going to say, you better tell everything because you're not going to jail. So that's that's going to happen. But if you recall, particularly for those in administration, I mean, there, there are some limits as, as, as for the amount that you can sue the state or a state institution. So that was why that's only $300,000. But the whole hotel insurance, the bus company settled, the president lost a job as well as the band director, police chief retired. They fired some band directors, a lot of things. This did a lot of damage because the FAMU Marching 100 was probably the most famous HBCU marching band in the world. So this had a lot of reputational damage for years. And I think they've finally been able to sort of get beyond that. But during that time, that was really just a stain on the institution as well. But today, these kind of arrests and mug shots and perp walks, all of this is very normal and common that when people haze, you know, they're going to have that. And I keep trying to tell students, you're trying to do what people did in the 80s. And when I was a student in the mid 1980s, as I joke with people, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet. And if somebody did some did something that, okay, you didn't know today, I, I set up on, on my, my uh, Google uh, News, a Google News alert. And anytime the phrase fraternity, uh, fraternity hazing pops up, I get a news alert and I get all the news stories. OK, so I got a news story today that says Penn State just sent out another reminder for students to say, you know, here's our hazing policy because they've had four hazing cases last semester. OK, and as I indicated, that was one of the high profile hazing deaths from 2017. And they have the Piazza Center there now. So those are some of the challenges that we see. But as you see, 46 people arrested for hazing University of New Hampshire. They're doing the mug shots, all of these kinds of things. So that's one of the trends. The second trend are parents as hazing activists. Now, if you've been around a long time ago, when I first was a grad student and I was a Greek advisor at Emory University, um, and I started at Emory in 1992, there was one parent activist. Her son, Chuck, was pledging a local fraternity at Alfred University in New York. So Eileen Stevens was the lone parent that was at all the AFA meetings, the NASP and wherever, speaking on campuses. But it was just Eileen for the longest, okay? Now there are lots of parents that have come, and they're using a lot of different things. They're out there speaking. They're pushing governors to say, sign new legislation, as Governor DeSantis did with Andrew's Law. They already had the Chad Meredith Act. He added, it says, enacting tougher hazing measures. So they're adding on. Uh, these are the parents of uh, Tim Piazza from uh, Penn State. It, they've been out speaking. Uh, I was actually able to facilitate a conversation with the families of these three students who died out there. They're engaged, okay? Because these are the kinds of things. If your son dies and the blood alcohol content is point. 495, they want to ask questions about that. The LSU case was interesting being in Louisiana because a year, within a year after his death, Governor Ever Edwards has signed tougher legislation. It happened really quickly. They did not waste, and you know, state legislatures don't move fast on anything. They move super fast on this, okay? But there's new legislation now that was uh, introduced this past October, something to pay attention to. Uh, one of the, the co-signers, Bill Cassidy, is, is my senator from Louisiana, uh, and it, it's a sensitive topic for folks in Louisiana to really address um, hazing on campuses. So it's something to pay attention to. They're looking for more transparency um, with hazing. So, you know, go and look this up, this uh, Stop Campus Hazing Act, and we'll see what happens with this, okay? But bipartisan support, 
Um, of course, Max Gruber's family, they have been really supportive of, of this kind of new anti-hazing legislation because he's our student from LSU, okay? Uh, but parents are getting more involved. I got this email from a parent. Her son died. It was sleep deprivation, car accident. Um, not far from here near Philadelphia. It was a student at Delaware State University, hazing case. Uh, so parents are getting more involved. They want to be involved. Um, the third trend, which to me is uh, the most troubling for us in our education, is this renegade movement. Um, and I've seen it before on the campus. When I was vice president for student affairs at Albany State University, we had a chapter that um, they just sort of initiated people without the organization or anything. And they just threatened to just initiate people and operate, you know, in the shadows. Um, and we were able to crack down on them and we had to really, you know, be proactive and, you know, during freshman orientation, telling parents and students, this group is not active or recognized on our campus. Um, tried to make sure we did that because there was a lawsuit uh, against Iona College uh, in the 90s that really addressed that kind of issue, too. So we had to look at that very differently. But there are people who are saying, you know what, campuses, y'all have too many rules. We're not doing this anymore. Um, we're going to do our own thing. Netflix, so here's some homework for you. Fascinating documentary um, called Frat Boys. And it's really about the former Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity chapter that's now known as the Gazzoni family at um, UCF. Very popular. And they're basically, we're a frat with, we're off campus, UCF, we don't, want, we don't want anything from you. We don't need anything from you. We're having our, you know, parties, and then they put this up on their Instagram page, why choose an unregistered student organization, okay? And you can see what they're selling, unlimited socials and date functions, unrestricted house parties, forget all those rules about kegs and BYOB, we're not doing any of that. Cheaper dues, no six-week moratorium, uh, organizational freedom, governed by the United States law, not UCF Circus Court. I mean, this is this is a movement. This is a real thing. OK. Um, and so now the institution is like, what do you do with a group like this that has a lot of popularity? And they're just like, we do our own thing. Y'all can't do anything about us. And, you know, the city hasn't been involved as well. But people are concerned that, you know, there is going to be some deaths associated with these groups that are, are you know, renegade or rogue organizations. Um, and those are the kinds of things as you know, this piece is they're rejecting the college in California, all the, the campus activities were canceled because they had a number of rapes that happened in fraternity houses. Uh, and so some of the IFC groups said we're pulling out. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to disaffiliate from the university. Uh, and so the university puts out a statement that they don't want to have any oversight. Um, they don't care about trying to prevent sexual assault and drug abuse and deal with the issues. But they created their own, what they're calling University Park IFC. And they're saying, yes, the relationship has deteriorated uh, because they've been told what to do. So we're seeing this as a trend. We saw some breakaway groups at West Virginia University. The University of Michigan has had this happen. And at Duke. And this is now eight NPC sorority, sororities as well. So like I said, I call the sorority section sort of the nice nasty this is a good example of that it's just like yeah we, we're pulling out too okay so the overall lesson is any organization that allows people to join is susceptible to hazing it's just part of what we have to deal with there's a lot that's going on um, with these groups and i just want to share some of the the challenges of things that are going on and uh, wanted to make sure I left enough time for you all to ask questions. So we have a lot of time for that. And um, so Mary Beth, uh, you're going to help us moderate this and we'll, we'll jump on in. I am. I am. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Walter. Uh, I was mentioning earlier to you that I've seen you present so many times related to leadership and black colleges, but I had never seen you present um, uh, on this topic. And it was really, really great. And I learned so much. And thank you. Thank you for the history, too. Incredibly important. So we have a whole bunch of questions, lots of different ones, lots of different topics. And I'm just going to start uh, asking them. The first one is, do anti-hazing initiatives fall under Title IX? It's a good question. That's, you know, it's a good question. I, I have been encouraging the organizations to look at 
um, them separately, but to look at them um, intentionally as well, because you're seeing um, the, the hazing laws really aren't as broad enough to address Title IX issues, but the organizations aren't doing enough in terms of education related to Title IX issues. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I just did an expert witness case. And so and this is a, a confluence of things where you had um, members who had graduated from a university who were fraternity members that sponsored um, an, a, a, an after party after a university associated step show. It wasn't a chapter. It was members of the organization who created a company and mm -hmm. they held an event where there was a sexual assault that happened. And so then the issue was, you know, is the, the chapter on campus responsible? Is the national fraternity responsible? Of course, the campus chapter and the national fraternity, like these people aren't even active members, but those non-active members created this company. They used all of the trappings of the organization, the colors, all of that. So it looked like it was the organization's event. But there isn't enough conversation about what does this look like in terms of sexual assault and Title IX. So I think they've got to be looked at separately. That hazing is that topic, but we, I don't. I think we're woefully um, uh, we're, we're woefully under educating, particularly fraternities and sororities, about Title IX issues. Because when you look at that data, sexual assault athletes and Greeks, just like with hazing. So I think they should be treated separately, uh, but a lot of times they are linked together. So you could have a hazing case that also has Title IX implications, uh, which we've seen as a part of that too. But I, I think we've really got to start having much more in-depth conversations and particularly in social media. Um, there have been situations, uh, particularly with some of the H MPAC work I've done, um, where you've seen people you know, do these long threads about how members of a certain organization are sexually assaulting people. It was something viral several years ago where the hashtag was me too, he was acute, where it was all these me too women saying they were, you know, sexually assaulted by members of Omega Psi Phi. So we've got to do a lot more, uh, particularly for fraternities, all fraternities to have those kinds of conversations. So I think they're still separate, but there's a lot of overlap because hazing can, uh, and it, it could be same gender sexual assault as well. And people are asking those kinds of questions, mm -hmm. sexual assault as a part of someone who is a pledge. So it is possible that as a part of pledging, a pledge could be sexually assaulted as well. So it's, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. So I think they need to be addressed separately, but there could be a confluence in a case that you could see both issues. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we have tons of questions, but we have lots of time to answer them. Yeah. So here's another one. Um, why do people haze? Is there a reason for people? Is there a reason that people use camaraderie to justify um, hazing? That's I guess that's one reason the person has heard. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, a lot of people have tried to intellectualize what hazing actually does. Um, as I said, from a historical point, it really was, you're the new people. Um, you have to prove that you're worthy. Um, I, I always joke that sometimes it, it it leans off of the Protestant work ethic. Anything that's worth having is worth working for. So people will sort of use that ideology to say, um, you want to be a part of our organization, you have to work for it to get in. And I'm just like, I tell people, it's so crazy that they have to do all these things to get in. And then when they get in, there's no level of accountability. It's like, what in life operates like that. You know, you can work hard to get a job and then it's like, you got a job and you don't come to work. You're going to get fired. But we tell people, you know, where you're, you know, brother, sister for life. We So those are part of the challenges. But I, I think it really stems with, you know, when I go back to German universities in the 1400s, you, the, the new students weren't viewed as equals. You had to prove yourself to be viewed as an equal. And I think that is the driving force. It's just like in professional sports. Sometimes you see where they have rookies that are being hazed. That happens today. Major League Baseball, is even if it's just making them dress up, that is still part of it. You're the rookie. Carry the, the veterans bags, dress up, those kinds of things. So I think that's the, the bottom line to it. Uh, and I always tell people hazing exists on a gradation. It's on a scale. If the groups were only doing things like we're going to mandate that you go to study, you know, study hall for five days a week for four hours or you have to do community service. I don't think you have the same concerns about hazing, but. It's the other stuff when they become creative to say, dip your hands in rubbing alcohol. We're going to light matches and throw them and you catch the match. How does that, what does that do in terms of building camaraderie? So you really get some of this power trip stuff that's going on where people have an opportunity to be in a, a 
power of dynamic. They haven't had that before and it becomes abused. Um, so I think it 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 is built on that. You you have to earn your spot. But the problem is now, and particularly with a lot of the research on um, students, there's a great book by um, Levine and Curitan, or Levine and um, Diane Dean, um, When Hope and Fear Collide, they talk about college students and just the struggle in terms of developing relationships. You know, I think one of the lines in the book, they say today students are more psychologically damaged than pre So if you got somebody who's got these challenges and they join a fraternity sorority, now they have all this power and prestige, sometimes it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Here's another one. Um, what advice do you have for college chapter advisors to help them be proactive and eliminate these types of incidents? I'm going to give you my real honest answer that people don't like, but it's true. I wouldn't be a college advisor today. I would not be a chapter advisor because I've seen cases where the person left holding the bag is the advisor. Um, one of the cases I just worked, I represent the graduate chapter because they got sued and they did everything right. You had people who were unaffiliated with the graduate chapter doing all the, but they still had to go through the process to hire an attorney who had to hire an expert to help get them off. And we did, they were dropped from the case, but it would be the scariest thing because a lot of these things are happening at times when that advisor who has a family is tired from the day, they're at home sleeping one, two o'clock in the morning and they're out. And I've seen, you know, a case I work, uh, young ladies, they, this was, maybe about five or six years ago, they were pledging like it was the 1980s. Everything is, so if there's anybody who plays in the, in the 80s like I did, that's how they pledge. And this was 2014, 2015. It was scary. The advisors just don't know. They You don't have the ability. So I tell people the best way is that you have to have a team of advisors, not a single solitary advisor. And I mean, you almost have to have like people who are popping up different places uh, spying to see what's going on. It's almost that kind of job because they have in their minds that they have to do this. And there's a lot of pressure. There's pressure from the, the extended adolescence. Sometimes there's pressure on the campuses because if you have some chapters that are notorious hazers on the, the, the campus, if your folks don't haze, they don't get the same kind of respect and they're called paper if they follow the rules. So there is that pressure. So I just don't know how anyone um, does that, it, particularly as a single solitary advisor, you have to have a team, but I mean, it, it's really work to do because they decide what they want to do. And, and it's not, it, this, the, the case I just mentioned, they were using burner phones, burner phones. So we're, we're talking about Nino Brown level stuff. I mean, I'm using all of my, my pop culture references, but this is Nino Brown. This is Snowfall. This is burner phones. So those are the challenges that you have. So I think being an advisor is scary. If somebody asked me today, would I be a chapter advisor? The answer is not no. It's hell no. Because I got a wife and two kids. My daughter about to go to and I'm not signing my name. And I'm being completely honest with you. And it's, it's bad that I'm saying that. But it's, it's true. You'd have to have. And I, so I tell undergraduates that with your advisor, you need to sit down with them and be honest. And you say, look, this is what we do. We're going to haze. So that person can make a decision to say, thank you for letting me know I'm not doing this. But they need an advisor to act to be active. So they're not telling them that. But I always tell the students, if you're going to do that, this person is your brother or sister. You need to tell them we haze and you need to protect yourself. And that doesn't happen. So I, I, that's my completely tra transparent answer. If I were asked to do it, the answer is absolutely no. I would not do it. And. Like I said, it's bad. I think the organizations have values, but until the, the, the members value their brother or sister who is the advisor over somebody who wants to be in an organization, yeah, I just don't know how a person does it. Your best bet is to have a team of people. And if a t the team does it, you better have some, some people on the team that are young who are willing to like pop up at one or two o'clock in the morning. You, you, I mean, it's on that level. You have to have uh, a detective type mentality as an advisor because they're not just going to, I just... I haven't seen enough people follow the rules as written. Thank you for being honest. That was a, a really lightning answer too. Um, okay, here's another one. Why do people allow themselves to be hazed? Well, I mean, so part of it is, um, if you think about it, I, I use it from a student development theory. And I'm, you know, I'm old school. I don't know what um, the folks here at Rutgers are, are teaching from. I, I love Arthur Chickering. 
And when I think about Arthur Chickering and people moving through those vectors and it talks about developing social competence, one of the easiest ways for somebody to develop social competence is pledging a fraternity or sorority. I mean, you, you develop it, you know, with your peers, with people on campus that see you. So it is a way for somebody to, to you know, join one of these groups, have an immediate connection, not only on their campus, but, you know, across the country, um, depending upon the type of group that it is. Like, you know, I, I see this particularly with Black, Black Greek-led organizations. Um, depending upon the campus, that person could be, you know, as famous, if not more famous than the athletes on the campus. Um, you think about it, somebody who's participating in some kind of step show and you got thousands of people cheering for you, who else gets that opportunity beside an athlete? It's, I mean, it's addictive for people. So people want that type of, you know, opportunity to join so they're willing to um, endure that kind of, you know, pressure to be a part of the group. And then sometimes it's a different mindset. You know, once again, I, I played in 1986. Uh, my dad's an alpha, my mom's a delta. And I remember my mom, so my mom's old school. So I, you know, I would talk to her every week, you know, how's it going? And she asked me one week, like, you know, how's it going? I was like, yeah, mom, it's sort of tough pleasure. And she basically said, those other boys did it. You could do it too. <laughs> Hang on the phone. I mean, it was like, they could do, they did. I mean, that's, that's how my mom is. She's just like, look, they did it. You can do it too. No big deal. So, I mean, it's just, you know, those are the kinds of things that um, we think about, but it, there is, um, there is still an allure to, you know, fraternity sorority life. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I was asked by students this other, uh, other night, you know, my daughter's about to graduate from high school and go to college. And they said, would you let your, your children join the fraternity sorority? My wife is an AKA, but she's also an attorney. She's just like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, particularly for our son. She's more worried about him than our daughter, but, you know, being president of Dillard and going to the, the, the new member presentation and like watching my kids, watch the new members, it's it's addictive. I mean, my daughter didn't really talk a lot about sororities, but, you know, she, you hear her say a little bit more like, yeah, yeah, and I go to college, you know, my mom's a Delta, but you know, she probably want to be an AK like my wife, but I, I could see it. You know, I saw it in her 12, 13, 14 years old, how she looked at them. It, it, I mean, it, it has a power to it. And I think even when you look at freshmen on campus, look at the Greeks on campus, you just watch how they interact with them and how they look, particularly when they have some new member presentation, you can see the people saying, yeah, I want that. You see how people respond. It's it's powerful. But I think that there is, I think you can make a student development case. And I, I've written articles to suggest that, that there's a very powerful case using student development theory that this becomes a way for people to help in terms of their identity development and they develop a level of social competence. It's a very easy way to develop it through that pledging process. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, here's another one. Got lots more coming in. Um, is there a regulated option for anonymous hazing reports for students? Is this something that a university or community would be in charge of as opposed to a federal program? Yeah, universities would. There are places that do this. Um, the father of the anonymous reporting is Ron Bender. Uh, Ron was my Greek advisor at University of Georgia. So we go back a long way. Uh, I think he's at Pitt Bradford now. I can't remember exactly where Ron is, but if you just look at Ron Bender, Ron Bender is the master. He he implemented programs like that at Georgia, at University of North Carolina. Um, so there are places that do anonymous reporting. And I've seen it places it really isn't um, abused. So I, I think it can be an option. Uh, but then sometimes you'll just have parents call. When I worked at Emory and Greek Alive, we had parents call to say, I, you know, I want to get my son in trouble um, because, they, you know, the, the child doesn't want to tell because if it gets shut down, they can't join. But the mom is concerned and say, hey, I think this group. And so it gave us enough to at least be able to um, do some interviews with the chapter. And particularly if you could put people on notice a little bit you might be able to get some of that behavior to be toned down a lot because they know like we know something's going on and we at least now have a record that we've investigated. So if something else happens later, you have some documentation to do that. Um, so anonymous reporting can be done well. I don't know if there's a federal system in place to be able to handle that. <laughs> We're having trouble with, with FAFSA right now, so I don't want to get a federal government any more work to do. I think it's going to be a case, uh, campus by campus program, but if you don't have that kind of program, I think it's something that you could implement. If you're a small campus, like I said, at Dillard, we could get anonymous reports directly from people. We didn't need a necessary hotline, and we were able to do some investigations because people would just reach out anonymously, or sometimes they just tell you, like, don't tell my name, but 
such and such is doing X, Y, and Z. Um, once at Albany State, I had a member of a sorority who came and told us, like, I don't know where they're going to be tonight, but they're going to be hazing. So she tried to turn in her chapter, and the police chief and I, is a great story, we're, like, driving around Albany, Georgia, like, 2 o'clock in the morning trying to find them. And I was, like, so excited, like, man, I'm going to kiss the people in the act hazing. But we found out they were five counties away. And that's the challenge. It's they they somebody had a barn five counties away and they were hazing in this barn. We there's no way in the world. Like I said, we rolled all over Albany, Georgia for about an hour and a half. And it's one o'clock in the morning looking for them, parks, all kinds of places. And then she came back and told us, like, yeah, I found out they went to this barn. That's I mean, they they will go through great lengths to sort of, you know, script out how do we get away with doing this? And, and unfortunately, we normally don't catch people unless somebody ends up in the hospital or dead. And that's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Here's another one. Uh, has there uh, been a study conducted to determine the impact of hazing on students whose parents are members of the aspirants desired organization? Are parents hazing perpetrators? Are aspirants coerced into hazing participation because they are legacies? You, know, you just gave yourself a research topic. I haven't seen that, but that's that would be great. So I, I endorse that study. That would be a great dissertation topic. Um, I would love to see that. I haven't seen it, uh, so it could exist, but I, I haven't seen anything like that. I think it's a great question. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, through your research, do you find hazing issues for black lettered fraternity or sororities and HBCU bands get more media coverage and attention than that of white fraternities, sororities, or cultural organizations? Yeah. And so people and particularly MPAC groups are very sensitive about that. And they'll say, oh, when we have something happen, it gets blown up. I, I honestly can't say that in, um, in my experience because Particularly, so the band case for FAMU probably got more attention than any other hazing case because when you think of hazing, nobody thinks band. They think, you know, if it's a fraternity hazing case, people just like, yeah, that's what they do, unfortunately. That's how people think. So they're just like, wait a minute, somebody died with the band? It was a drum major? That's why that one stood out. I, I'm convinced of that. Uh, but particularly in the last decade or so, you know, a lot of the cases involving IFC groups have gotten a ton of attention. Um, the Piazzas, they have been out. They're really generating a lot of attention. So when I talked about parents, they're out there actively engaging. I know in Louisiana, there have been, you know, hazing cases at Southern University, which is an HBCU involving uh, MPAC organizations. They haven't gotten the same kind of coverage that the IFC groups at, at, sub, at uh, LSU have gotten. It's not even close. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a perception that it's been disproportionate, but it really hasn't. I, I think it's been fair. And I think that because the parent activists uh, have mostly been white parents, they've really driven that. So you're seeing more and more of that coverage become amplified. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, an interesting question as well. Um, what strategies would you recommend to best combat the poor word of mouth or bad press that Greek life experiences? Obviously, Greek life has plenty of benefits and we want to showcase them, but we would also like a way to rebut any accusations that we might receive. Thank you, they said. <laughs> yeah, no, so yeah, I, I'm I'm a, a fan of doing some on a college campus to do sort of like a poll or climate survey and people don't really sometimes afraid to do it but to sort of ask the people on the campus what are your impressions of greek life just to sort of see what's the impression of the people on campus and so you start with that as your baseline data for then the groups i mean if you're really brave you would ask them about different groups to say what you know what comes to mind when you think about this group and you could do a word cloud i mean there are a lot of different ways you could do that um but see what that impression is and then to look to see what kinds of activities and events are you doing that either, you know, support that or, you know, work against that. And those are the kinds of things. I think the challenge is, and I always try to tell people, um, you know, Greek students will say, well, nobody talks about the good things that we do. That's, you hear that a lot. And um, there's this like Chris Rock monologue where he'll say, you know, guys want to, you know, get credit for stuff they're supposed to do. It's like, if you say, I take my kids to school, <laughs> what you want, a cookie? 
I mean, that's, you're supposed to. So it's like Greeks saying, well, we do community service. You're supposed to. Why do you want to, you know, but but we don't really spend enough time promoting those kinds of things. And when you look, and I tell chapters to audit their social media, when you look at what they're promoting on social media, it's always social type stuff. It's We're having this kind of event and those kind of things. It isn't a lot of the, you know, we're working to, you know, think about being a culturally based group in the state of Florida right now. How many culturally based groups or all groups are involved in addressing the DEI issues in the state of Florida? Are they calling press conferences? Are they doing, are they going to the Capitol to meet with their legislators? They aren't doing those kinds of things. So sometimes people are saying, well, we aren't getting credit for, you know, the little service that we do. And then I, the harder question is, if somebody dies, how many hours of community service do you have to do to make up for that death? And just give me the number. And then I'll start telling people like, oh, get them a pass because they completed 10,000 hours of community service. So they're, they can kill somebody. Um, the, we have to be honest about what we do. So I think a lot of times people just say, well, we're not getting enough credit for doing the things that we're supposed to do, but the thing that you're supposed to do pale in comparison to the other things that you do. You don't spend as much time doing that. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities now for fraternities and sororities to, to play in issues that are impacting college students. All fraternities and sororities could really lead to push to try to, you know, have student loan forgiveness or any student related issues that are impacting them through Congress. We don't ever see that. We don't see any activism from those groups that, you know, to take the lead to address issues that impact all college students. So there are opportunities out there, but, you know, we're still stuck doing the kinds of things that we do. And you don't get enough credit for that because you're supposed to do that. That doesn't really stand out. But anytime someone gets hurt or gets killed, that's going to disproportionately drown out anything that you say that's good. And that people have to be honest. But I think you start with the campus assessment. And what do people on campus think? You know, I tell students, Talk to administrators on campus. Ask them, what do you think about our groups? But, you know, but we don't ask those kinds of questions. And it's sort of hard to hear that, but you sort of have to do some baseline um, understanding of where you are and then build from that. So that's the suggestion that I give that. And I, I was on a campus once where not long ago they did that. And so they were just sort of like, yeah, the, the non-Greek students really hate us. I mean, so they were just like, we did it. We know. Okay. So they, they know that. So what then can they do to be more engaging and do things that, you know, people um, can look at them in a new light. So that that was helpful for them, but they at least, you know, did that first step. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what impact have you seen uh, as a result of the growth of social media? You talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Talk a bit more. So, so social media is a gift and a, cur and a curse even by itself. A lot of groups want to have those viral moments where they do something really cool. Um, and, and I think, Sometimes that reinforces, let me just stick particularly with like black fraternities and sororities. When new members and they have their probate shows, that dominates social media. It's on Instagram. That, I mean, that's it's just huge. It's on TikTok. Everybody that goes viral. I mean, people don't go viral because they were out protesting. It's just not, that's not what's happening. So it can be good. The thing I tell them though, as an expert witness, is that they need to audit their social media because even in a probate video as an expert witness, I might see something in that video and in that show that tells me they violated their rules or they post something on Twitter. I still call it Twitter. I don't care what Elon calls it. I call it Twitter. You, I found things on Twitter that I've been able to use as an expert witness to help paint a picture of this is a chapter that embraces hazing openly that, yeah, we pledge. And it's post-1990. Those kinds. So they need to be very careful about the kinds of things that they are putting out on social media and be much more um, deliberate to say, what is our social media strategy? How are we building our brand as an organization? And is it always just social things? Are we showing some other things? Do we? And I've seen some chapters do this recently, which is great. They highlight members that are, here's a member. They're in this, this, and this, and this. They're graduating. They're they're doing this after graduate. All those things are great. We need to do a whole lot more of them, particularly now we're in sort of like this. Um, I don't know what to call it. It's sort of like these elaborate graduation photos that people like to go viral with that. They'll do photos and even videos with the cap and gown and those kind of things. We've got to do more of those kinds of things. And so um, it, it can be helpful, but I don't think we're using it to amplify the benefits of the organization. It's still a lot of the, the social type stuff. It can be a problem because when I work a case, the first thing I do is go to social media for that chapter. 
That's the first thing I do. And I want to see, are there some breadcrumbs to, to show if they've been doing some things for a while and I've been able to find them uh, on social media. So I, I always tell them that as somebody who doesn't work, the first place I'm going is social media. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, here's an interesting one too. What are the consequences currently for those who participate in the hazing, the, the actual pledges? And I realize they have another name, but we all know what people. Yeah, so it, it depends. Uh, it, that's the challenge too, because a lot of the policies, both for the national organizations and for some campuses that when you start a process, you're joining, you agree that you will not be hazed and that you will report hazing. And if you don't report hazing, then you will be sanctioned. I think that's a that's an unwinnable or untenable position for that person because so I start the process I'm pledging a, an organization they start hazing I report it the chapter gets suspended the members get suspended I don't join the organization so now the group that I'm trying to be a part of I pissed off everybody they're not going to tell Unless they just decide, like, I don't like these people anymore. They're not treating me right. I don't care. I'm telling them. You'll get a few. And that does happen. But for most people, they become co-conspirators immediately. And they're just like, I'm not telling. So now they're in violation, just like the members are. And I think sometimes it's unfair. And I tell members of the organizations, we, they're saying, well, they could just quit. They don't have to do this. So it's like we're holding the aspirants more responsible for our rules than we are for our rules. If we just follow our rules and they don't have to make that hard decision. So we're telling them, look, if you don't like it, you just quit. And I don't think that's fair. So I, I, I struggle with policies that say we're going to sanction the person, the aspirant, because you basically are telling the aspirant, you have to make a choice in the beginning. And if you decide that you're going to tell, then you've already decided that, yeah, I want to be a part of the group and you might be initiated by the, the national body, but there is no chapter. And the people who are in the chapter are also suspended, so they hate you, and they're talking about you, and you're not getting respect from anybody else because they're going to say your paper, you didn't go through the process in the Black fraternity sorority experience. So it's, I, I think it's, it's sort of hard to say. I, I think you've got to be able to have some kind of level of amnesty for those aspirants who do come forward, a way to sort of protect them so they aren't viewed as a person that um, does all that, but I, I don't think there's any incentive for them to tell. Um, because they want to be in the group. And so you're basically saying they didn't follow the rules. I tell on them and now I'm blowing up the whole thing. I don't know why they would choose to do that. And I haven't found a good reason why somebody would, because once again, you tell what you were hoping to join now is over. <laughs> it's over. So why even go through the process when the group initiates you, but there is no chapter, the members aren't active. What was the point of it? Thank you. Thank you. Here's a question about how would you distinguish between hazing and workplace toxicity? Oh, I, I'm not an expert enough to know. I, people will use that term in terms of hazing with workplaces. And I think there have been studies um, that's beyond my scope. So I try to I'm not going to try to extrapolate too much. Um, I, I know there have been some studies, but that's that's beyond my level of expertise. And I think no actually once I got I got asked to, to do a case like that and I I, I backed off. I was like, no, that's not, I don't know enough about that to, to be a credible person. So I'm okay. Gonna yeah, no, I, I like that answer actually, because it's always better to stay in your lane, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, here's a, here's another one. A really, these are all amazing questions. Um, couldn't these unincorporated groups like the Gazzoni family still be penalized for violating the student code of conduct? How would that work from the point of view of administration? So, yeah, so that's a good question. I, I think a lot of campuses are trying to figure out how, how far does our reach extend in terms of off-campus groups? And I know there's a lot of conversations back and forth, like how responsible should we be for things that happen off-campus? So if, that, if their fraternity house is five miles away from UCF and a sexual assault happens there, um, is that your Title IX issue? because they're students? What if it's a non-student that's there, but your students are involved? It's, I, I think colleges and universities really wrestle with, you know, how far does our, because some people will say like, I, this has nothing to do with you. I'm a student there, but you don't have any right to deal with everything that goes on in my life. So if something happens, why are you going to discipline me? If I go and rob a store, are you going to discipline me because of that? It didn't have anything to do with you. I just, and that's their point. We deal with 
you know, Orlando police. If Orlando police aren't dealing with it, then you can't touch it either. So that's, I mean, some campuses will stretch a little bit more farther off campus and address things. But I think some, and particularly the, the legal person on the campus is going to be more conservative to say, do we want to open ourselves up to be responsible for the activities of students further off? And then, like I said, there are going to be some people who push back to say, this isn't in your jurisdiction. Just because I'm a student doesn't mean you have, you know, jurisdiction over everything that I do. And that's the, the balance. So I, I know schools are still wrestling with, you know, how far you know, I, this thing on my, you know, at Dillard, we had a situation where we had a young lady who came for orientation. She had been on campus a day, met some guy online. He came, picked her up from campus, sexually assaulted her off campus. She reported to us. And so the question was, and we did, we put it on our Clara report, but I talked to some experts to say that shouldn't have been on your Clara report. He was not a student. It didn't happen on campus. But then some people say, but she was picked up from your campus. So you have to, you know, but we couldn't discipline the person who, I mean, she had to go through the criminal system. We provided support for her, but we were just trying to figure out how do we report this? Is it a clear violation for us when we, I mean, she had just gotten to campus. We didn't know her, and but she came back and reported to us, and we did know, but that person was not a student. He just picked her up from campus. So it's, I don't, I don't know what the, you know, the right answer is. I would say work with your legal counsel on campus to say, does your campus have a philosophy about how far off campus does our jurisdiction go? And how do we manage that? Because I, I think it would be different based on the campuses. Uh, I've seen people look at it different ways. Thank you, thank you. Um, so here's one, what advice would you have? You kind of alluded to this in your own family, but what advice would you have for parents who are members of the Divine Nine, um, the black fraternities and sororities for folks who might not know that on here and have children who are interested in our respective organizations and will be in college in about five years. Are there improvements in hazing culture? I, the improvement that I would say, I think there is much more awareness. Uh, I think there's some awareness that you can do with your kids um, just to have those kinds of conversations. Um, so it's like we watched documentaries. There's a new documentary from PBS called Hazing. It's done by Byron Hurt. You can look at it free online. I would look at it with your kids. Um, like I said, my son is 15. And he's just sort of like, I don't want to do fraternities because people haze. I mean, he sort of, he knows about our, because I mean, he lives with me. So I mean, that's part of it too. But, you know, my daughter's more open, but just watching those kind of things and having conversations about it. And then when they decide that they're interested um, to continue to have those conversations, uh, I think you, you just have to be engaged with them, um, you know, and if my daughter decides, you know, I'm I'm sneaking up there, is I'm, I'm going to look to figure out what's going on, but I, she'll know enough, you know, in terms of how to make the right decisions, those kind of things. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing. Like I said, my wife is more um, squeamish about it than I am um, in terms of, because I think there, there are benefits in my dissertation. I looked at benefits from joining. So I, I, I do see there are lots of good benefits. But sometimes it just, it depends on the chapter too. You just look at some and it's like folks, that's the biggest thing they've ever done and they might not do anything else. And I, you know, I want to be a part of a chapter with people who have something to lose <laughs> because they're focused a little bit differently. You got people who want to go to med school and law school. You can reason with them a little bit more than folks who are just like, this is the highlight of my life. I, you know, join this group and I'm just having a good time. That that becomes a little bit more problematic. So uh, I just think, you know, there are a lot of resources out there. I think you've got to have open conversations about them. Say, look, this is the deal. Um, you know, I want you to be careful. We need to keep an open communication. If, you know, you feel like you're in danger, you know, something, you got to let me know. You just have to have that kind of conversation. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Here's another one. Um, there are so many good ones. Um, it seems like most hazing incidents are based on sexual assault. Is there a committee or council within these Greek councils that are in charge of educating and protecting students? No, there can be some. I, you know, I was on a um, task force with the North American and the Fraternity Council a while ago that they had, they pointed out the three major areas where we see misconduct, alcohol, hazing, and sexual assault. That was one of the three. Um, but I, I don't think we, you know, like I said, in my experience, I don't think we're doing enough targeting Greek organizations about sexual assault. So I think that that is an opportunity where just like we do mandatory hazing workshops every year, I think there should be mandatory sexual assault. I just, we started doing them at Dillard. That was it. mandatory sexual assault. Uh, we, we do it covered in orientation, but covered again for Greek organizations because it's a different 
power dynamic. Uh, and so I think you've got to address it that way. So I, I just think we're, there's so much more that we can do. So anything that you do more than what we're doing on campuses now, I think is an improvement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This this is sort of uh, uh, connected. Um, have you seen cases of LGBT hazing possibly being more intense than heterosexual uh, like assault of individuals? Now, there's some writing about that. So, for example, the Florida a and ban case, part of the conversation about that is that the drum major who was killed was a gay man. And I think Part of the reason he felt that he had to do this because people were questioning him as a gay drum leader. And so for him, it was proving that, you know, I'm a man just like everybody else, I think is the way it was sort of interpreted. But I think part of his severity of his beating was because he was a gay man. Um, that's a good question. I, and there have been some, you know, studies about particularly fraternities and um, gay members. Um, there was a book that looked at that a little bit uh, in a little bit more depth, but I haven't seen a lot of research lately. You might look and see. I don't know what the, the latest conversation is about how that impacts hazing and sexual assault. Um, but like I said, I don't, we're not talking about that enough. I think that's just another area where we need more research. We need more conversation. We need more education about it. Uh, but that's still for some organizations, that's still sort of a taboo topic that because fraternities and sororities are still very much heteronormative groups. Um, I mean, there are organizations founded as fraternities for gay men or for um, lesbians. I mean, there are groups founded like that with their explicit mission. That's who we serve. Uh, but there are lots of groups. Um, I was at Bucknell and, um, recently, and one of the fraternities, uh, one of the active members, openly gay man. I mean, just, you know, so that, there are groups, I think, that are much more accepting than others. It just depends. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity there for us. I, I think we just scratched the surface. Thank you, thank you. Um, we got time for one or two more questions. Here's one, what can an institution do to get student organizations to understand the criminal nature of hazing? Is there anything, can they bring people in? Um, anything you can think of? Yeah, I, no, I think there are people, um, like I said, I, I, I love to talk to the criminal side because particularly for me, and. I didn't show you all, all the real graphic pictures that I have. Um, expert witness work has opened up my eyes. So I understand a criminal very well, um, working with police, working with um, attorneys and understanding and looking at the laws. Um, so, you know, I definitely, I would love to do it, but I think you can get local people um, who know your laws of the state. You can have your um, campus attorney could do some work. You could have someone from your police department or the, the city police or a DA talk about that, somebody who's done a case. So I think there are lots of different ways that you can get at that, lots of different resources that you can use. Um, like I said, there are some high profile national attorneys that do that kind of work too. Um, I've done work with Doug Fearberg. Doug does a lot of the hazing cases. Um, he's he's great. So there are lots of different ways you can do it. But mm -hmm. definitely I say, and you might mix it up one year, you bring an attorney, one year expert witness, police might do one, those kinds of things. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a, um, our last question, but I think it's a really good one. And that is, what if you're working on a campus and you're working with fraternities and sororities and you have almost no um, support uh, from student conduct or from administration in addressing these issues? What do you do? And, and I think this person might be asking just to protect themselves too, right? Yeah. And also to protect students. Yeah, no, I, I you you got to make sure... Sometimes you have to do education for the people on campus. Um, if you think there's a potential problem to say, could we have a workshop to talk about hazing so that key people on campus can understand what's going on and what kind of strategies we can take? Um, you have to look for an advocate. If you have a campus attorney, it's, it's a risk management issue. <laughs> I mean, they don't want to deal with it. And if you're sort of raising the alarm now and you guys haven't done some things to mitigate any problems, if there is a lawsuit, that institution is going to get sued because, you know, it's sort of like, y'all didn't see this coming. It's much easier. In most campus cases, campuses don't get sued because they can show we've done the workshops. We've met, you know, Bowling Green has had a number. They had a hazing death a couple of years ago. 
Um, I spent a day with them last year and I met with the conduct people. We talked about how do you do your investigations. I mean, we went through a lot. I met with several groups. So they had a, a major high profile hazing case that the institution paid out. So everybody's attention is like, what do we do to keep addressing these issues? And you don't want to have to come to that. So if you sort of have a sense to say, you know what, and just like I say, if it's upper level administration, if it's the attorney, you can just say, look, I'm on the ground. We have some issues. We need to make sure people on campus understand what's going on so we can do a better job addressing these issues and look at it as a risk management opportunity because that's what it is. Uh, and it will save you from being in a lawsuit. Like I said, most of the time campuses don't get sued um, because they can just say, nope, we brought in Walter, he covered X, Y, Z. They let you off. They go after everybody else. But if there's an opening, schools have had to pay out because they didn't do anything. So it it, it becomes a liability. That's, that's the only way I can I can frame it. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Walter. This was fantastic. Thank you for answering all the questions. I know we still had about six left, but we're running out of time. But I, I wanted to say um, thank you to um, the Proctor Institute for the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions and um, to all the attendees today. Those were amazing questions. We will be sending out the video. And um, I know... Um, uh, Walter, that you are open to talking to people. Just put up your email. Feel yeah. free to reach out to Walter. Uh, like I said, I've known him for years and years and years, and he's just um, absolutely wonderful in terms of a resource. So thank you so much, Walter. Really, really appreciate you being with us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great questions. I appreciate it. But yeah, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to help any way I can. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.